Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Kirsten Lobato? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Kirsten Blaise Lobato was born in 1982 and lived in Nevada. Her parents divorced when she was young, and she lived with her mother. Kirsten was removed from her mother's care at the age of five and lived with her father and stepmother. Before she attended high school, her family moved to Panaka, Nevada. This small town, with a population of about 700, is about 166 miles north of Las Vegas. Most of the people in the town were members of the LDS church, and the environment was very strict. Kirsten was a bit rebellious and did not fit in well. There was friction between her and her classmates, and she was bullied. Eventually, Kirsten became highly promiscuous, which made her extremely popular with some of her peers, but she still didn't get along with everyone. When she was 15 years old, she pulled a knife during a confrontation and was sent to an alternative school. She graduated in May of 2000 with her high school diploma. Kirsten moved to Las Vegas and lived with various acquaintances. She worked as a clothing challenge dancer and eventually lived at the Budget Suites Hotel on Boulder Highway. In early July 2001, Kirsten moved back to Panaka to be with her family. She told at least nine people a story about something that allegedly happened sometime around May 2001, right outside the hotel where she had lived in Las Vegas. She claimed that she was attacked by a black man who she did not know. He pulled down his pants during the attack. In an effort to defend herself, Kirsten produced a butterfly knife and attacked his groin area. She was attempting to execute a member separation agreement, so to speak. Kirsten fled the scene and left the city, she had no intention of returning to Las Vegas. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On July 8, 2001, at about 10 p.m., a homeless man in Las Vegas, Nevada, was searching a dumpster behind a bank when he found a dead body. The man notified the police about his discovery. Here's what they found during their investigation. The victim had been beaten on the head, stabbed, his throat was slashed, and six of his teeth were knocked out. In addition, his member had been severed from his body. It was found several feet away. The police later identified the man as Duran Bailey, who was known on the street as St. Louis. He was a violent criminal with a history of dealing drugs. Duran Bailey had been accused of horrible crimes. Some of those accusations were consistent with the unusual damage that Duran had sustained, almost like it was revenge for something he had done. On July 20, the police were notified about Kirsten's story. Investigators wondered if the man that Kirsten encountered was Duran Bailey. The police traveled to Panaka and found Kirsten. They interviewed her about the statements that she had made to various people in the area. Kirsten told them the story about the black man who attacked her. When referring to his member, she said, quote, I was trying to cut it off. Unquote. Kirsten insisted that she drove away after defending herself. The man was alive at that time. She said, quote, I didn't think anybody would miss him. Unquote. Kirsten threw the knife and her clothing out of her vehicle. She mentioned that she had a baseball bat in her car, but said that she only used the knife. She didn't know exactly when the attack happened because she was high on methamphetamine. The police arrested Kirsten for murder. Here was their theory about the case. On July 8, 2001, the same day that Duran Bailey's body was found, Kirsten was looking for drugs. She approached Duran and he offered to give her drugs in exchange for sex. Kirsten had a history of being mistreated, therefore she reacted violently to this offer. She brutally murdered him and then told people it was self-defense. The state offered Kirsten a plea deal. 
She could plead guilty to manslaughter and serve three years in prison. She rejected the offer. Kirsten claimed that she was in Panaka, Nevada during the time of the murder. The man who she mutilated with the knife was somebody other than Duran Bailey. Kirsten went to trial in 2002. On May 19, she was convicted of first-degree murder. About three months later, she was sentenced to 40 to 100 years in prison. In September 2004, the Nevada Supreme Court reversed her conviction and ordered a new trial. This happened because the defense was not allowed to properly cross-examine an inmate who testified against Kirsten. Kirsten had her second trial in September 2006. This time she was convicted of voluntary manslaughter. She was sentenced to 13 to 45 years in prison. Kirsten appealed her conviction. Her attorneys disputed the victim's time of death based on insect activity, and they had a new alibi witness. A woman claimed that Kirsten talked about fending off an attacker in Las Vegas weeks before the murder. This made it seem like Kirsten stabbed someone other than Duran Bailey. In March of 2011, Kirsten's appeal was denied. In November of 2016, the Nevada Supreme Court reversed the denial. The exculpatory evidence was presented at a hearing in October 2017. On December 19, 2017, the court ordered a new trial for Kirsten Lobato. Ten days later, on December 29, the state dismissed the charges against her. Kirsten still had some time to serve for another unrelated charge, but she was released on January 3, 2018, after a judge ordered her to be freed immediately. Now moving to my analysis. The charges against Kirsten Lobato were dismissed, and many people consider her to be innocent. The state, of course, believed that she was guilty, despite her victory in court. This brings me to the question, was Kirsten guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that she was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Kirsten described an attack that was consistent with the death of Duran Bailey. Her story included a black man who had been attacked with a knife and mentioned how a certain organ may have been missing from his body. The police checked local hospitals. Nobody else had come in complaining about a severance package. If Kirsten did not attack Duran, who did she attack? Where was this mysterious person? Kirsten was high on methamphetamine during the attack. The drug has an association with violence. Duran Bailey was a drug dealer. It makes sense that Kirsten would have been interacting with someone with his professional qualifications. During her first trial, an inmate testified against Kirsten, saying that she confessed to the murder. In my opinion, this is not inculpatory because jailhouse informants are notoriously unreliable, but the testimony of this witness did damage Kirsten's case in the mind of jury members. Moving to the exculpatory factors, the admission that Kirsten made did not involve a criminal act. Rather, her narrative was one of self-defense. If one were to believe her story, she was attacked and used a knife to defend herself. She never admitted to a murder. Kirsten stated that her attacker was alive when she left. There was no evidence introduced suggesting that Kirsten knew Duran or had ever met him. She never identified him as the man who attacked her. The exact time of the attack that Kirsten described is not known, but it probably happened over five weeks before Duran was killed. Again, an alibi witness came forward and said that Kirsten was talking about the attack before Duran Bailey's body was found. The attack that Kirsten described occurred seven miles away from where his body was found. It was clear that Duran was killed at the dumpster. He was not moved there from somewhere else. The body of Duran was discovered on July 8, 2001, at 10 p.m. According to the medical examiner, there was a 95% probability that Duran was murdered sometime between 9.50 a.m. and 3.50 p.m. that same day and a 5% probability he was murdered before or after that time range. The state agreed that Kirsten was three hours away in Panaka, Nevada at 11.30 a.m. and was probably there as early as 10 a.m. Even using the later time of 11.30 a.m., the latest Kirsten could have been in Las Vegas was 8.30 a.m. She wasn't there when Duran was killed. 
22 fingerprints were found at the crime scene. None of them matched Kirsten or the victim. There were shoe prints in blood found just a few feet from Durant's body. They were made from a man's size 10 shoe. This was larger than Kirsten's shoe size. DNA was recovered from the crime scene, but none of it belonged to Kirsten. Kirsten's baseball bat had no blood or DNA on it. Duran was a violent offender and drug dealer. He could have had any number of people who wanted to kill him. A local woman claimed that Duran had attacked her a few weeks earlier. Maybe this woman, or someone she knew, decided to get revenge on Duran Bailey by revoking his membership. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Kirsten was guilty of murder? No, I believe she was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm convinced that she was actually innocent. She had nothing to do with Duran's death. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Kirsten was a troubled young woman who found herself addicted to substances. She made up a story about being attacked to explain why she did not want to return to Las Vegas. It's also possible that she really was attacked, but either way, she did not come in contact with Duran Bailey. When the police questioned her at her parents' residence, she thought they were talking about her story, but they were really talking about Duran Bailey. Investigators became fixated on the similarities between Kirsten's story and Duran's death. They refused to believe that it could be a coincidence, which motivated them to find a way for Kirsten to be guilty. For example, they convinced themselves that because Kirsten was a drug user and promiscuous, she must be dangerous. Kirsten had allegedly been the victim of mistreatment when she was younger. The police found a way to use this against her. They developed this theory that she reacted violently to a proposal made by Duran. There was no reason to believe this was true. Investigators ruled out self-defense as a possibility due to Kirsten's poor moral character. As soon as Kirsten told her story, the police decided that she was the killer. Now moving to my final thoughts. The case of Kirsten Lobato illustrates how easy it is to be falsely convicted of a crime. It also serves as a reminder of the importance of never talking to the police. Kirsten spent 11 years in prison because she believed the police were interested in finding the truth. In reality, they had already decided she needed to pay regardless of the truth. They viewed her as a bad person who needed to be in prison. It didn't matter if she committed a crime or not. The criminal justice system has an incredibly strong bias against anyone who uses substances. Unfortunately, when a person adds substances to their life, they subtract the presumption of innocence. Those are my thoughts in the case of Kirsten Lobato. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.